All right, welcome everyone uh, to the Victorian era architecture that's being given by Michael Bridgman. Um, my name is Jennifer Gursky. I am the administrative office manager with the Madison Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Madison Trust, um, we celebrate and advocate for historic places in Madison and also try to create educa educational opportunities such as this, um, where people can learn more about historic preservation and architecture. A um, couple housekeeping items. Everyone is muted for the presentation. And uh, once Michael's finished, you will be able to unmute yourselves and I will turn that feature off and you can uh, ask away any question that you might have of Michael. Um, and I, we just wanted to remind everyone that on December 1st, the tickets go on sale for part two, which is arts and crafts. That will be given by Jim Traeger is going to be doing that. So I think that'll be a fantastic one too. So after December 1st, those tickets will be on um, Eventbrite and accessible through our website. So I think I will pass it over to Michael now. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm glad to be here this evening um, talking about Victorian era architecture, an interesting topic, a big topic in many ways. So I'll do the best I can to uh, give you some kind of introduction to at least some of the principal styles of Victorian era architecture. Uh, my name again is Michael Bridgman. Um, I've been a volunteer with the Madison Trust for Historic Preservation uh, in some capacity for almost 40 years, it turns out. Um, I've been uh, helping to lead the walking tours for more than 15 years, and I served uh, two stints on the board of the Madison Trust. My current gig for the Trust is to post articles to the website um, about once a month. There'll be one coming up in early December and hopefully one in January and so on and so on. Um, I also volunteer for some other organizations, including the Historic Preservation Office at the Historical Society, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy. Um, I'm retired after a 37-year career in public television where I did promotion and communications work. Uh, you're going to see some images now that are not part of the presentation per se. They're more to give you a sense of what Madison looked like in the late Victorian era. And of course, one of the key questions is, what is the Victorian era? Well, strictly speaking, it's the reign of Queen Victoria in the United Kingdom from 1837 to 1901. Um, but in America, the Victorian era usually means the years from about the Civil War to the turn of the 20th century. Some people take it further to as late as oh, 1915. I'll begin in the mid 1850s um, for a couple of reasons. One, the railroad arrived in Madison in 1854. And in 1856, Madison got its charter as a city a charter from the state. 1850s was also the period of the so-called Farwell boom in Madison. That's when Leonard Farwell was a key figure in the city, and there was a lot of growth uh, in Madison in that decade. In 1850, the population of Madison was just over 1,500. By 1860, it was 6,600 people. So it had been quite a large amount of growth in that decade. I'll end in about 1910. Things are changing by then, especially architecturally, Classical revival, colonial revival, Beaux Arts, and various progressive styles are starting to emerge. The Victorian era really saw a parade of styles. Uh, it was they were eclectic, uh, they were diverse, they varied from the highly decorated to the quite spare. This was a time of rapid change in America and in Madison. As I mentioned, in 1850, the population was 1,500 here in the city of Madison, more or less. By 1910, it was over 25,000 people. So there had been a lot of growth in the city. But something to keep in mind is even in 1900, um, well, 1910, I should say, Madison was the seventh largest city in the state. There were a lot of cities in Wisconsin with much larger, not necessarily much larger, but with larger populations than Madison. Nonetheless, this was a period of urbanization, a growing middle class, lots of technological innovations, and really the beginnings of mass production and mass distribution. The important thing to remember is that Victorian era, excuse me, Victorian era architecture 
is not one style. It's many styles. Not all of those styles are seen in Madison. Also, styles are kind of mushy around the edges. And another thing to keep in mind is pure examples of almost any of these styles, with a couple of exceptions, are very hard to see, are rare to find, especially in a relatively small city of its time like Madison. And I'll point out at least one of those exceptions. Still, what we see is interesting, worthwhile, and in many instances, good design. Much of what we'll see is architect design, though most of what was built was not. Most of what was built, and this is still true, is the work of builders who use pattern books, magazines, observation, and even their own imaginations to create the buildings. All buildings, any building, nonetheless, can help us better understand the people who made them and the people who use them. I said there was a parade of styles, but it's a pretty disorganized parade in many ways. The styles do not unfold in a linear progression. They're not neat and tidy. Time periods for the styles are not sharply delineated. They happen simultaneously, they overlap. Some styles are ephemeral, they don't last very long. Others endure for a long time. As Jim Drager, one of my favorite lecturers on Wisconsin architecture, said in a lecture some years ago, styles persist because they work better than others. It's that simple in many cases. Styles are shaped by numerous factors, including economics, cultural values, social structures, popular taste, technology, geography, and I cannot possibly deal with all of that in what I'm going to be doing tonight. I will be focusing largely on the exterior look of the buildings that we see in Madison. What all architectural styles do is they combine form, materials, and ornament, and they help make the past visible and palpable. What we build expresses who we are, what we value, and what we aspire to. And in this period, design choices were numerous. The motives and desires of owners and makers were numerous too. Style is experienced and expressed in the moment. People mix, borrow, filter, change, and adapt styles all the time. The same is true today. And defining and describing styles usually happens in retrospect. What we see may not be what the Victorians saw in the places they built. Still, we can get some understanding by paying attention to the forms that buildings take, the materials that are used, and the ornaments that decorates them. I'll be looking at six styles tonight. Um, this will be a quick view of each one of these styles. I won't be able to go into a great deal of depth, but I hope you get some sense of what each of the styles look like and how they varied from other styles at the time. My focus will be principally on Madison. On the plus side, I'll show mostly buildings that you can still see today. On the minus side, some styles are more plentiful than others in Madison, but that's okay. I'll focus principally on houses with occasional forays into religious, commercial, and public buildings. We're going to start with the Italian, which goes from the 1850s until about 1890. This is a national style. It's seen in cities and towns all across America. It was popularized by pattern books and builder's manuals. For the first example, we'll look at the Mirrors House, which is in uh, Mansion Hill. It's a two-story house, and it has a very kind of contained footprint. Here it's a cube. There is an L to the rear. It has a low-pitched roof. It's hipped. Uh, gables are also seen on Italian eight houses. Italian eight houses typically have overhanging eaves, as we see here. Almost always, there are brackets beneath the eaves, and they are very often paired. Note the denticulation in the brickwork below the fascia. Denticulation is a wonderful word. It uh, means dental, like teeth, the tooth-like effect you get in the brick uh, uh, below the fascia. It's a common feature of the masonry buildings in the Italian age period. The rear porch on this house also shows typical Italian age detailing. The posts that support the porch have beveled corners and there's scroll cut ornament where the posts 
intersect with the top of the porch. Builders might have used pattern books as sources for this kind of work. The Van Slyke House, also in Mansion Hill, is just down the street from the Mears House, which is appropriate since Napoleon Bonaparte Van Slyke was the nephew of James Mears. They both came from, I think, Vermont. Anyway, this house was designed by Donnell and Kutzbach. It has sandstone walls. Um, it's a kind of sandstone called Prairie du Chien sandstone. Note that the uh, porch that we see today is not original, but it was done in the early 20th century uh, to blend in with what uh, the house still looked like. There had been a large veranda on this house. Here you will see that dentals appear under the eaves between the brackets. The dentals, again, the wooden blocks that create that like tooth-like effect. Not only do we have wooden dentals in the eave, we have the denticulation in the stone below. Denticulation, as I mentioned, comes from classical design. Cupolas are very common in Italian houses. They help with air movement. That's one of their significant purposes. Usually the windows could be opened, uh, often by your help, the servants that work for you, you would do this yourself. And when you open the windows, it would help draw warm air up and out of the house and create circulation through the house. Very important uh, when uh, air systems were essentially non-existent, mechanical air systems were essentially non-existent. The Bowens moved to this house in 1859. It had been built about uh, four years earlier by Seth Van Bergen. A particular style of Italianate house is the Italian villa style. And that's what we see here at the Bashford House in Mansion Hill. What marks Italian villa is a tower. In this case, the Bashford House is basically L-shaped. There's some additional wings to the back, but as we see it from the street, it's an L-shaped house with the tower at the intersection of the two wings. Notice that the windows are tall and narrow. Each of the windows is set off by a frame that entirely surrounds the window. Notice on that front wing that the windows are paired so you really get quite a large expanse of glass in some of the rooms in this house. The tower windows could be opened to help with air circulation, not unlike the cupola we saw at the Bowen house. This is how the house looked in 1870. Um, there's a lot more ornament on the house, including many false balconies, or balconettes, as they're sometimes called. There are shutters on all the windows. Some are open, some are closed. And notice to the side, there is a small formal garden. Now, I don't know when the garden disappeared, but a building showed up on that property in the 1930s, an apartment building. Now, the Italianate style, it means to evoke vernacular farmhouses in northern Italy. It's formal and more picturesque, if you will, than the Greek revival, which was the dominant style before the Italianate. The Italianate, like so many things, began in England, at least from our point of view, began in England and was popularized in the United States as early as the 1830s. The way windows are treated is a key element of the Italianate design. Usually they are set off with some kind of elaborate lintel at the top and often a decorative sill at the bottom. Or as in the case of the Bashford house that we just saw, a complete stone frame around the house. I've been showing high style masonry houses, but Italianate was easily adapted to wood frame houses like this one in Mansion Hill. There are brackets under the eaves and quatrefoil windows in the gables. Here the sash windows are plainly framed. This house was modified in about 1893, which is probably when the veranda was added to the house. About a block away, there is a front gabled house that is also wood frame. Um, there are no brackets or dentals at this house, but there are fancy lintels over the windows, which sort of expresses the Italian aid style. The Italian aid style was also very popular for commercial buildings. We see it here in the German American Bank building, which is at the uh, King Street corner of the square. The eave has paired brackets. There are no dentals. 
um, the windows are framed in a fairly typical way. This was designed by John Nader, who's a name we will encounter again. My last example of the Italianate is another commercial building, this one on State Street. Um, this is the Schulkamp building and uh, was finished in 1890. Um, this is done in yellow brick. Notice the window detailing on the State Street facade, which is in that inset, is much more elaborate than it is on the Gorham Street facade. After all, the State Street facade was the business side of the building, and that's what really mattered. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the Romanesque revival style. This goes, uh, begins in the 1850s before the Civil War and actually continues past the turn of the century. Um, it looks to the medieval Romanesque period for its sources and ideas, and the key feature is the rounded arch adapted from classical Roman design. In this instance, Madison has some excellent examples of the style. The McDonald Pierce House represents a particular expression of the Romanesque revival at this time. It's called the round arch style or Rundbogenstiel. The German is intentional. There are round arched openings over nearly every window and the doors. The wall surfaces are smooth. Here it's in Prairie de Chine sandstone. You'll notice there's little or no eave, but there is a lot of decoration at and beneath the eave lines, a lot of denticulation and stone and so on. There are also those corner devices. I call them Tyrells because I haven't figured out another name for them. There is a cupola on this house, as you can see from the one photo here. And on the other photo, you see the inside staircase, which is under the cupola. This house has high-end craftsmanship, both inside and out. It was designed by Samuel Donnell and August Kutzbach. Kutzbach came to the US in 1852, and he and Donnell moved to Madison together and set up their practice in 1855. Kutzbach was large, a part of a large German migration that haven't happened in the 1840s and 50s. And of course, there were architects in that group. And Kutzbach had received some formal training in Germany. The round arch style, or Rundbogenstiel, took its cues from the German Romanesque and was part of a search for a German style of architecture. Donnell and Kutzbach were also responsible for the Keenan House, which is across the street. It has this time faced in cream brick. The round arch style was also popular for religious buildings, particularly for synagogues like Gates of Heaven. This was the first synagogue built in Wisconsin and is still one of the oldest synagogue buildings in the United States. It was erected for a small congregation of German immigrants. This building was originally on West Washington Avenue and was moved to James Madison Park in the 1970s and now is owned and maintained by the Parks Department. In this case, Kutzbach gets sole credit. Donnell, his business partner, had died in 1861 at the age of 37. When Kutzbach himself died in 1868, Madison lost an extraordinary architect whose gifts went well beyond his work in the round arch style. But not all round arch or Romanesque revival buildings are Rundbogenstil. While round arches are a definitive part of the style, here they have a simpler form and more restrained detailing than in the Rundbogenstil buildings that we just saw. The simpler mode of Romanesque revival became particularly popular in church buildings, Christian church buildings. Here are two Catholic churches designed by John Nader. Both have round arches above the windows and the doors. Holy Redeemer on the left dates from the late 1860s and is clad in stone. St. Patrick on the right was built about 20 years later and is faced with brick. Romanesque revival designs were used for churches well into the 20th century. Next up, the Mansard or Second Empire style. The Mansard style is easy because it's named for its roof form. That's about as simple as it gets. A Mansard is a hip roof with two pitches. The upper pitch is usually very low or even flat and is often not even visible from the street. The steeper slope 
becomes part of the facade, essentially, and almost always, I would say, not even almost, always includes dormer windows. This style was used in many civic and public buildings, such as Madison's old post office, which is on the left half of the square, uh, and the Park Hotel, which is also on the square, in its current location, actually. The name Mansard comes from Francois Mansard, a 17th century French architect. The roof style he employed was revived during France's Second Empire, that's the reign of Napoleon III, from 1852 to 1870. It then comes to the United States as the Second Empire style. The Kendall House in Mansion Hill offers a good lesson in the Mansard style. Here's how it looks today. There's a prominent Mansard roof with dormer windows. The upper pitch is not visible from the street. There are eaves with brackets, not very visible in this photo, but believe me, they're there. And there are narrow windows with elaborated lintels and sills. That all changed when the house was modernized in 18, excuse me, I have to go back a step. Here's how the house looked in 1861, about six years after it was built to a design by Donnell and Kutzbach. It's Italianate. It's got a shallow roof with a balustrade, a cupola, not very visible, but it's there, and a small balcony over the front entrance. But that, this house, all changed when the house was modernized in 1873. This photo from 1931 shows that 60 years after remodeling, the Kendall House retained its full mansard regalia. It now has a full width porch across the front, as well as a porch on the right side, which was actually a generous veranda that looked toward Lake Mendota. A bay window was added on the left. There are very elaborate dormer windows on the mansard. There's even a decorative roof crest, which is no longer there today. The Second Empire, or mansard style, was generally seen as a prestige style and was especially fashionable in the US in the 1860s and the 1870s. But houses with mansard roofs appear in Madison through the 1880s, and they're often on fairly modest houses. Here's a small house from the first settlement neighborhood that shows how a simple vernacular residence could be made more fashionable with a mini mansard. Uh, this house may have been moved to this site in 1888, and if so, the porch and the projecting bay with the mansard may have been added at that time. This is the Morton House on Baldwin Street, which packs a lot of Second Empire style into a relatively modest house. It's a two-story brick house with an L to the rear. There are dormer windows in the steep pitch of the mansard that faces the street sides. You can see just barely just a few brackets under the principal cornice line. But there is a rectangular bay that projects above the main roof line, and it has its own mansard cap and a fancy window. You'll see a lot more brackets and dentals under the eave of the lower part of the bay. Note the little free library in the foreground, which has its own mansard roof and a tower. And just a point of curiosity, when I looked at this particular house on the city assessor's website, the style was given as Victorian Georgian Regency. I'm still not sure exactly what that means, but I do not rely on the city assessor for style definitions. Here is a house on Jennifer Street that dates from 1887. We're getting near the end of the line for the Mansard style in Madison here. Note here that the upper windows are not dormers, but they are inset within the Mansard roof. The L to the right may be a later addition. Mansards have gone in and out of fashion ever since, and they still appear on contemporary construction projects. Now I want to take a few minutes to talk about another Romanesque style uh, that emerged in the Victorian era. This one quite different than the uh, Romanesque revival that we looked at just a few minutes ago. It's named for the architect Henry Hobson Richardson, who was prominent from 1865 until his death in 1886. He worked out of Boston. 
he was drawing on medieval precedents from Spain and France, from Southern Europe. The earlier revival of Romanesque really drew on Northern styles. Richardson developed a distinctly American style in his version of the Romanesque, so distinctive it got his name. One of the best examples of the Richardsonian Romanesque in Madison was demolished nearly 60 years ago, the old law school building on the UW campus. Romanesque revival usually emphasizes rough faced stone. Here is Lake Superior brownstone. There is a general simplicity of volumes and form. Prominent roof lines use hips and gables. There are dormers, towers, and turrets. The eaves are generally shallow to non-existent. This particular building was designed by a Chicago architect named Charles Frost. A rare residential example of, in Madison of this style is this house built as a rental property. The investor reused rough face stone from a demolition of a house he had purchased, and he used that stone to create a solid Richardsonian appearance. The tower is low and stout. The two-story gables on the sides are covered in shingles, but more about that later. What remains of Richardsonian Romanesque in Madison is mostly public buildings. And Science Hall on the UW campus is a common variant on the Richardsonian model. Note that there is rock-faced gray stone at the foundation and red brick above. This building was designed by Alan Conover of Madison with Henry Koch of Milwaukee. The tower at the center dominates the approach on Park Street. Chris Brown arches help to define most of the window openings on this house. The arch over the main entry also features rough faced stonework. In Richardsonian style, entries are often recessed under arches. Note the short little columns with simple capitals that support this entry arch. This commercial building on King Street has Richardsonian Romanesque features. The conical cap of the tower dominates the roof line. The building is clad in yellow brick, uh, but there is a belt course, several belt courses of rock faced red stone that provide contrast and help delineate each level of the three story facade. A subtle string course of rough faced masonry provides contrast and delineates, I'm sorry, um, of rough faced masonry connects the arched windows and runs over their tops too. The round tower is supported by simple columns with plain capitals. Nationally, Richardsonian Romanesque was used for a lot of different buildings, libraries, courthouses, churches, grand mansions, row houses, and large commercial buildings. In Madison, what we see is a lot of Romanesque Richardsonian, broadly speaking, Richardsonian Romanesque features that you'll find if you make an effort to look for them, like the row of arched windows above the State Street storefront, or the bold half round entry to the Red Gym on campus, and a Romanesque revival capital on Mifflin Street just off the square. For most people today, Queen Anne is probably the quintessential Victorian style. And there's a lot of Queen Anne housing in Madison. In 1880, Madison's population was just over 10,000. And by 1910, 30 years later, it was two and a half times larger. As I mentioned earlier, 25,500 people. For many of us, this is what a Queen Anne house looks like. It's a big frame house with a tower at the corner. But this is the Queen Anne house too. And so is this. The impact of construction technology in the Victorian era becomes evident in the Queen Anne style. It's much easier to build bays, towers, turrets, and gables using lightweight materials and balloon framing, which by this time was common practice. 
Fewer specialized skills are needed to assemble a house. Lumber is now cut and planed to standard dimensions. Decorative details like trim, casework, doors, shingles, and a whole lot more is increasingly made in factories. And networks of lumber companies, mills, dealers, and railroads allow for wide distribution. In short, building has become faster and generally much cheaper. The technology inside the home also changes dramatically during the Victorian era. There are new ways to provide for heat, light, power, and sewage disposal. The Campbell House in Mansion Hill has the irregular massing we associate with Queen Anne buildings. Houses can be anywhere from one to three stories high. Deeply pitched roofs, usually of many types. There are hips, there are gables, there are conical roofs. One story porches are sometimes quite large and they are often wraparound verandas. The posts and balusters on these porches, when they are there, they're very small on this particular example, often show whimsical or, or neoclassical styles. Towers are common on Queen Anne houses, but they are not universal. Keep in mind that towers appear on houses in other styles too. Varied treatment of exterior surfaces is a hallmark of the Queen Anne style, especially in wood. If you look at this picture and start at the lower right, there are wide clapboards on the body of the house and moving clockwise, we then see narrow clappers on the bottom of the tower. There are wavy shingles on the upper tower and the lower gable. And at the top of the gable, we see square cut shingles. Again, very typical of the Queen Anne style. Like most Queen Anne houses, the Bull House in the Vilas neighborhood has no tower, but demonstrates the typical asymmetrical massing of the style. There's a front facing gable that dominates the main facade. Multiple gables are the norm for the Queen Anne style. Bay windows are common. Here they're created by canted or chamfered wall. That's the 45 degree cutaway under the principal gable, thus creating a two-story bay. There are many types and sizes of windows. Some are large, thanks to changes in plate gap glass production. These larger cottage windows, as some call them, often had leaded glass transoms, colored or clear, and you see transoms in both of the large windows on the front of the bay on this particular house. Ornament in the Queen Anne style is eclectic and derived from many sources. Here we see decorative embellishments on the gable boards. There are shingles in the two upper gables, and they're actually different. There are large brackets under the main gable where the corners are chamfered, and the truss work is highlighted above the small entry porch, which has spindle work. Queen iron houses can also be done in uh, masonry. Um, at this house, which faces Orton Park, the composition is much like the Campbell House. It has steep gables with one dominating the front facade, and there's a tower with a conical cap. There's a rough faced stone foundation under the veranda, and above that we see brick with stone trim. Brick exteriors offer fewer surface variations typically than wood frame siding, but there are a variety of window treatments here. There are large sash windows, small fixed windows, and a generous Palladian window in the main gable. Another really good example of a masonry house in Queen Anne style is the Steensland house, which shows more variety in surface treatments than the previous one. There's rough faced stone, brick, and even some clapboards in the gable and in the dormer on the front of the house. There's quite a bit of decorative brickwork and stone on the chimney shaft. The wide front porch is supported by classically, classically styled ionic columns. Queen Anne was not hesitant in borrowing from classical styles. The street elevation is dominated in this case by a square tower that is on the center of the front facade. This building incidentally was designed by the Madison firm of Gordon and Ponak. 
Like so many other architectural styles, Queen Anne came from England. In the United States, it was freely adapted and quickly became widespread. But most of it was not grand, and for the most part, not designed by architects. This pair of houses, their neighbors actually, show that Queen Anne could easily adapt to tight city lots. The house on the left is brick, and the one on the right is wood clad. They have similar massing. They both have chamfered two-story bay windows under prominent gables that are covered in different styles of shingling. Those gables are supported by big brackets. The disposition of the windows on the houses is actually quite similar. This small house for Frank Wooten has the key elements of Queen Anne. There's a regular massing and front facing gables. The gables are shingled and two have small square windows. There's a chamfered bay. Note the elaborate brackets under the gable on the far left. The large cottage windows have decorative lintels. Turn posts support the porch and there is spindle work at the top and the bottom under the eave and for the balustrade. It's a kind of industrialized vernacular. The builder probably ordered many of the parts and assembled them on site. There are a lot of smaller Queen Anne houses on Madison's east side, which at the time was the home of Madison's factories. This house on Baldwin Street is similar to the previous house, but plainer. It has multiple gables with shingles and square windows, but there is no bay and there is no open porch, though there may have been an open porch at one time. Even a one-story cottage near the Elgati factory is a simple gabled L in form, yet betrays some Queen Anne characteristics. They're seen in the front-facing gable with its square-cut shingles and a standard Queen Anne square window. Queen Anne was easily adapted to commercial uses, as we see here on the Matthew Gay building, which is on State Street. It was built by a tailor for his own business and other tenants. It has a prominent tower at its sharp point, if you will, with a conical cap. Here, the variety of surface treatments is done in masonry. Smooth brick appears on most of the building, but there's rough face stone highlights, and there's an interesting pattern of molded brick in sort of a wagon wheel pattern below the cornice line. The final Victorian era style I'll cover is the shingle style. True shingle, shingle style houses in Wisconsin are rare. But I'll start with Madison's best example. This is the Hillier House in University Heights, and it is clad entirely in shingles. The shingle style blends elements of Queen Anne, New England colonial, and Richardsonian Romanesque. The style emerged in New England and moved west and wasn't really defined and named until decades later. Roofs are typically steep and varied, like we see in the Queen Anne and the Romanesque Revival. But the overall form is simpler and quieter. The style balances horizontal and vertical elements, especially compared to the more vertical Queen Anne. There's also less ornamentation than we see on Queen Anne houses. Unlike its stylistic cousins, the shingle style is associated only with residential buildings. Well, maybe not only, but close to only. The massing of shingle style houses is less centrifugal than Queen Anne houses, but by which I mean it's really more contained. The emphasis here is on volume over decorative effects. At the Hillier House, that bay-like tower on the right is low. It's more embedded or integrated into the main mass of the house, more so certainly than we would generally see in a Queen Anne style house. On this house, the shingles are uniform. That's quite different than the four shingle types we just saw on the Campbell House, which I show here again on the left. This continuous skin of shingles 
helps unify the various volumes and planes in the shingle style. Let's go back to Mansion Hill and look at the Jackson House. Here there's a rhythmic pattern of shingling that decorates the prominent two-story gables on this house. There are three wide rows of shingles alternating with two narrow rows. Given its gambrel roof, this house is usually classified as Dutch colonial revival. But gambrel roofs are also used in the shingle style. Shingle styles do not have to be covered from head to toe in shingles. So with rough phase sandstone at the ground level and shingles above, I see this as a late shingle style design, admittedly from 1907. This was done by Frost and Granger out of Chicago. Now, let me go back to a house uh, that we saw a few minutes ago, and that's the Brown Rental House, which I use an example of the Richardsonian Romanesque, but it can help illustrate the shingle style too. And that's appropriate since H.H. H. Richardson was important in developing the shingle style, as well as creating his Richardsonian, his related, excuse me, Richardsonian Romanesque style. To see shingle style, we need to look at the side elevations and focus on the two-story gables covered in shingles. At the third story here, there's a large Palladian window, a common feature of the shingle style. The broad shingled arch over the Palladian window is mimicked toward the bottom of the gable. Here again, the house uses both shingles and stone. The shingle style helps demonstrate the fluidity of stylistic categories. Stylistic precision wasn't the first concern of most architects, builders, or homeowners. Now the shingle style and the Queen Anne developed at the same time and they borrowed from each other. The Buell House at the top of University Heights is a very visible hybrid, a house that is Queen Anne in form. It's very vertical, it has the front facing gable, and there's even a tall circular tower at the rear with an encircling veranda. Yet the house is covered entirely in shingles. At ground level, four courses of shingles alternate with a string course of dark brown molding. That sort of creates a look of rustication. The wider belt course molding with dentils helps separate the ground level from the stories above, where shingles continue uninterrupted until the very top. You'll see just a little bit of rough face stone at the lower right. That's again like Superior Sandstone, which at this house creates a solid visual base around the entire house. I especially like how the shingles are arranged with an eye for the telling detail. In the main gable at the front of the house, the shingles come together and seem to tuck under the cornice trim and the shingles gently curve to meet the inset window. Because of its undeniable Queen Anne form, I think this house belongs in that category in spite of its extensive and quite excellent shingle work. Shingle style was a progressive or reform style that emerged again at the end of the century and it was part of a conscious attempt to develop an American style. It was never widely distributed, but you can see its impact in details on quite a few houses in Madison from around 1900. Some see the shingle style as the early precursor of modern styles that emerge in the 20th century, and the 20th century is where we'll be heading in future presentations in the series. But those won't be my job, those will be the work of Jim Drager. I hope this quick review has given you some idea of the architectural styles and variety and ideas during the Victorian era. It was a time of great energy in America, and that's seen in what was built, the bold use of form, ornament, and pattern. And the Victorians were not shy at all about mixing, matching, and trying out new ideas. There are a lot of guides to architectural style in America, and I have quite a collection of my own. Um, each book has its own take, its own framework, and its own list of styles. Here are some of the styles from the Victorian era that we are not looking at tonight. It's not because they may not be important, but they are generally not seen in Madison or very infrequently seen. And so 
they didn't make the list. Another thing to keep in mind is we have not seen interiors of any of these houses, and ideally we should, to better understand why the outsides look the way they do. There are a lot of books that where you can see interiors. There are also books about social history, economic history, and technology, important factors that I barely touched on. So to learn more, look through some style guides, visit online sites, and best of all, take a tour next summer with the Madison Trust for Historic Preservation. At this point, I'm finished, so I'll give it back to Jennifer. All right, great. Thank you, Michael. Let me just... Okay. All right, just give me one second here. Okay, so if we've got any questions, um, you should be able to unmute yourselves now and uh, Michael's available to answer anything. And if I can't answer, I will not make it up. Michael, hi, this is uh, Terry Venker. You used hi, a word, you used a, thank you very much. That was a fabulous presentation, uh, so interesting. You used a word that I had not heard or have not seen before. I think you said chamfered. With bay windows. When you were talking about bay windows, you you taught you oh, said Oh, chamfered. Chamfered. Yeah, what, yes. What does that mean? I couldn't follow. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll describe that again. A chamfer is simply, if you have a, a right angle corner and you cut off the an angle, usually at 45 degrees, that's a chamfer. And it's widely used in Queen Anne houses. I live out in the country. Spell it. Oh, I'll spell it. I'm being my... Um, producer is suggesting I spell the word. It's C-H-A-M-F-E-R. The other word that's sometimes used is a cant, K-A-N-T, I prefer chamfer. I live out in the country where I see a lot of rural houses, many of which are Queen Anne, and sometimes virtually the only Queen Anne feature on them is this chamfered bay, typically two stories high underneath the main gable. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think mostly we sh uh, I, I like to say thank you so much for what a wonderful uh, 48 minutes um, of, of history. Uh, so it, it, it was a real treat. The pictures, uh, the vo vocabulary, uh, and all that you presented was a real treat. So, so thank you for embellishing our Wednesday evening. And I'm Trying to see what's behind you. Do you live in a Victorian era house? <laughs> well, no. Not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. We, we're, we're actually in the process. One, one of one of our the interests is that we're in the process of uh, of renovating an 1860s uh, 1860 Victorian home, um, and so uh, this was this is wonderful. Um, the outside we can't change much. Uh, we're actually trying to figure out the inside, um, but it's uh, a story for another time. Yes, absolutely. Well, good luck with that. One more question. Hi. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the architect who designed Gates of Heaven Cathedral or synagogue. 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 Um, um, I, it's my understanding that he designed several other public buildings in Madison, some of which were successful and some, I believe, the old capital burned down. Could you tell us a bit more about him? Sure. Um, August Kutzbach, um, in the 1850s, was without question, I think, the most important figure in architecture in Madison. He did, in fact, design the second Capitol building in Madison, um, which he used the round arch style, and it was faced in sandstone. Um, and he built that at the same time he designed and built the uh, McDonald Pierce House, the one is that is now the Mansion Hill Inn. The building started fairly small, had a smaller footprint. It was expanded later. It actually was quite a successful building. The fire in the building was not through any fault of the construction, at least at the time. I think there was some renovation under, uh, going underway at the time. 
though admittedly, if I'm correct, I will look at my producer, they were thinking of replacing the building anyway. Oh yeah. At about that time. Yeah. Um, I have, my secret producer is Jack Holtzeter. City, City Hall also. Yeah. City Hall. <laughs> and, and Jack knows more about the Capitol building than almost any other living human being. <laughs> so yes, he did the Capitol building, but know that the dome that was put on top of that building, the second Capitol, was not designed by Kutzbach. That was done by a different architect named Stephen Shipman. But Kutzbach also designed the old city hall in Madison, uh, which is where the 100 Wisconsin condominium building is. And that stood until, I think the 1950s, uh, early 1953. 50s. 1953 is when that was demolished. And that too was round arch. Um, he did a number of other houses. Some of his other houses, it's a little unclear in some cases, but some of his other houses are also um, still standing. Um, of course, I, I see somebody looking at me and I have to give a shout out to the Van Slyke House at 510 North Carroll Street, which I did show you. Um, and the owners of that house are being very careful in bringing that house back to life, both inside and out. He did the four houses on the Pinkney and Gilman. Yes, he did all four, I'm being reminded. He did all four houses at Pinkney and Gilman. That's the McDonald Pierce House, now the Mansion Hill Inn the Kendall House, the Keenan House, the one that I showed you stripped back to its early Italianate, and that Italian villa style house with the tower. All four of those were done by Donnell and Kutzbach. Thank you. Great, have we got any more questions? from anyone? If not, just let me add that um, I mentioned that I do this um, monthly more or less uh, post for the uh, Madison Trust website. And given all the work I've put into this presentation, I'm going to expand on some of these topics with some future posts. There is more to be said about the shingle style. I don't wanna go on and on about it, but there's more to be said. And one of the styles I didn't mention was stick style. And I think there's something to be said about that in Madison as well. But that can happen, that can happen online. But uh, I hope you look at the blog posts when they come up. I know that Jennifer does a very good job of getting it posted in a timely way and sending out a monthly link to the trust website. Yes, our blog goes out the first of the month, every month. So um, if you're on our newsletter, um, those go out and they're also on our website. You can find them too. Yeah, there's, they're collected there. So you can read the stuff that I've written and other people have written um, for at least the last year or more. I'd, I'd like to add something about Kutzbach. Oh, I have an addition about Kutzbach. The, the Shipman Dome really broke his heart and precipitated his suicide. Yeah, what Jack is saying is the, the dome on his Capitol building by Shipman um, as Jack said, broke his heart. And I've heard this story that he was very uh, disheartened by it because the dome is not, he had designed a dome and the dome that was put on the building really did not match the building. It was, <laughs> compared to the rest of the building, it was a clumsy wet marriage of the two. And he was so disheartened by this that it is thought that that's why um, Kutzbach ended up taking his own life, which, uh, which he did, the story goes, by putting on his heavy coat loading his pockets with rocks and walking into Lake Mendota. Um, in November. In November. Um, so a sad story and sad as far as I'm concerned because I'm sure that he had a lot more to give in terms of influencing the architecture of Madison. And then in the <laughs> 1870s or 1880s after he'd taken his own life, his widow submitted his drawings to the state fair competition in art or architecture. I think it was in art and they won first place. I don't know if you all heard that. So um, there's, a, there's a, actually a good story. There is a, at least there was, there used to be a profile of Kutzbach on the Historical Society website. Um, and maybe I should do something about Kutzbach for the website for the Madison Trust. I make Jack do most of the work, but I could do something too. I think that sounds like a terrific idea. <laughs> There's obviously lots of good information. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And again, just a reminder that part two goes on sale December 1st, so that will be accessible on our website. Tickets are the same price, $5 members, $10 non-members. Um, and uh, have a wonderful evening. We're taking December off, so have a safe and healthy holiday season. Um, if we don't see you, and hopefully we'll see you in January. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.